five, four, three, two, one. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. Yes, sir, reading you loud and clear. Hey everyone, it's Randy Coppola, U.S. Launch Report, Veteran Space Report. Now it's a very warm late October day outside the gates of Cape Canaveral with the iconic Navajo in the background. Now we'll be heading to pad 41 for the launch of the Atlas V rocket in the 401 configuration, launching a GPS satellite. But I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that later. Just want to tell you a little about the Atlas itself. Now, as you know, Cape Canaveral is a storied pad with numbered pads that go all the way back to the very early launches. In fact, the Navajo itself was test launched at pads 9 and 10 on Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Well, the mighty Atlas was launched from pads 11, 12, 13, and 14 on Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, going back to the late 50s and early 60s. And just a footnote on those early Atlases, they were the ones that took the Mercury uh, Atlas program to get put the first American in orbit, John Glenn, much more powerful than the Redstone boosters for the first Mercury flights. Anyways, just want to give you a little backstory because we're heading out to the pads. We're going to have a great view and some great coverage of this launch for you. But for now, it's Randy Coppola, U.S. Launch Report and Veteran Space Report. So here we are in the cool of the History Center, and here's a good chance to explain to you the Atlas and the configuration that's gonna be flying. Now, there's several Atlas configurations that go by a numbers reference. So this is the one that they'll be launching. It's in the 401 configuration. What that means is it's a four meter diameter fairing at the very top. The solid rocket booster count in this, in this configuration is zero. You don't see the solid rocket boosters as you see in the other configurations, and the one stands for how many motors are in the Centaur second stage. So up here there's one motor. So there's different configurations. You take a look at this Atlas over here, it's the same booster main body but it's augmented by uh, the four foot fairing and there's three solid rocket boosters and then the one Centaur. So there's several ways that they can configure the Mighty Atlas to push the payload. Now when you want to com compare this to the first atlases that pushed the Project Mercury rockets up, that one, those rockets pushed up 360,000 pounds of thrust. Just the one stick on today's atlases put up 860,000 pounds of thrust, a much more powerful and efficient rocket. Well, we're still at the History Center and it gives us a minute to talk a little bit about the history of the Atlas. Now, we're launching an Atlas V tomorrow with the GPS satellite, but let's take a quick look at the very first Atlas that it owes its lineage to. Here it is, the first Atlas, and this is an Atlas D that pushed John Glenn into orbit. In fact, you can see the Mercury capsule mounted where the nuclear warhead was intended to be. Now the Atlas was America's first operational intercontinental ballistic missile and it was powerful enough to put that capsule into orbit. The Redstone which launched Alan Shepard wasn't powerful enough to do that and that's why the Redstone was called an IRBM or Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile. The original Atlas had three motors underneath and two things called verniers for guidance. Today's Atlas has one main RD-180 motor and amid the controversy of that RD-180 motor is it's manufactured by Russia which is giving a lot of pressure for us to develop its replacement which is called the Vulcan. Now, at the History Center, they have an, a booster engine from an actual Atlas booster. And so amazingly, the great condition it is, you can realize how powerful it was back in those days. Now, it was fraught with problems when it first launched. Atlas explosions were very common. In fact, 
Pad 12 had a catastrophic explosion of an atlas just at liftoff, scattering debris and taking the pad out of service for many, many weeks. But that was during the rush to get things redone, so engineers were right on the scene and immediately trying to get those atlases ready to fly. Because the space race was on and the atlas was our ticket to intercontinental ballistic nuclear range to be able to launch towards Russia from various silos in the Midwest. Well, it's time to head out to pad 41 and where that Atlas V is being rolled out and ready for us to put our remote cameras. Now, we'll share that shot with you, but I just wanted to pass along one thing. This original Atlas booster it was at the time a very, very efficient rocket, but that Russian RD-180 puts out approximately eight times the power that this rocket engine could. It's just an amazing development in the evolution of rocket technology. A big development here on Pad 41 is the erection of the gantry. Now the gantry is essential for manned spaceflight, and as you know, Boeing is being building the CST-100 and their effort as part of the return to flight effort for com commercial craft for a commercial craft under the NASA contract. So progress being made. They've just put the roof on it since the last launch. But what a sight! And this will be the first you'll see of what will be a very common sight as astronauts embark that gantry and ride an atlas to the International Space Station and maybe beyond. Now tomorrow's launch is for the GPS 2 block and it's 11 of 12 in the whole system and each one of these satellites costs 1 billion dollars to put together and get into orbit. It's the fourth generation of GPS satellites and it was built by Boeing. Now the GPS system, which is expensive in the billions of dollars, is free for us to use. And think of how many applications on just your cell phone that you get to use that utilizes this system. It's revolutionized navigation, shopping, delivery, so many things that we've been able to use with the GPS system. And booster has begun throttling back up to 100% until we hit the 2.5G throttle segment. And your response looks very good. You know, we've been making these videos for quite some time. This is our favorite view, actually, because right behind me is the flame trench. It's even more interesting now because when you see the crisscross cranes, they're working on that gantry. That gantry is going to be so significant when it comes to the future of space travel. So imagine in the near-term future, with the CST-100 capsule being built by Boeing as we speak, getting off of that gantry and into that capsule. That's what they're preparing for, and we're here right now, and we really love the moment that we can enjoy it. So when that rocket exhaust comes through that flame trench right behind me, it's mixed with water and creates an amazing amount of thrust, rocket propellant, water rocks, everything's thrown right out of there. So we're going to cut to it and show you exactly what it looks like ground level if you would survive standing where I am right now. Now, as we've discussed on U.S. Launch Report and Veterans Space Report in the past, how what it really takes to get a rocket into space, especially one as heavy as this GPS Block 2. But anyways, behind me, high pressure helium, the toxic chemicals, the liquid oxygen at ne negative 275 degrees, the exhaust itself at 5,000 degrees, almost a million parts working in harmony. Each part is not an off-the-shelf part has to be made to government specifications. So when there is an accident, you have to step back and say, geez, I'm surprised there's actually not more of them because getting into space is such a complex endeavor. It's really brought home when you're here, hearing all the noise and the gases pumping around the pad as they're getting ready for launch. It's really exciting to be here, especially before the launch. All the preparations have been made. The plugs, everything's being checked one last time for tomorrow's launch.